<laughs> well, again, I want to welcome everybody to January's uh, PAC meeting. And again, I want to thank Brother Larry and the Greater Love Missionary Baptist Church for hosting uh, this month's PAC meeting. I'm very pleased to see a very good showing today. Um, I have great hopes and and I'm looking forward to seeing all everybody here getting great information, blessed, and doing the things that we know that God wants to do for our community. So, as I call this meeting to order, if you look at your agendas and you wonder how we're going to run things, the order of the agenda is usually the way that we go. So the first thing that you see after the call to order is our devotion and prayer, which is done by our host church so and I understand we'll be getting a small presentation so I will turn this over to brother Larry and uh, we'll move so that we can see as well good evening and welcome to greater love missionary Baptist Church uh, this church edifice is a Randolph structure. Now, I say that as a lead into the kind of presentation that we'll be sharing with you in the way of a devotion. So, it's worthwhile for you to have a historical sketch and a little background information relating to uh, greater love which had been uh, previously Park Avenue Baptist Church and before that it had been Second Baptist Church and while I am giving you that little bit of a historical blurb uh, in 1857 this church originated in Rossville okay? And uh, out of this church came not only Second Baptist here at this location site, but our sister church eventually came over uh, on uh, Downing and Ash. And that church site is, of course, uh, Cyrene AME, Cyrene African Methodist <coughs> Church. So we're going to try to move this along you know that I have a lot to say and share uh, and I tried to do that in terms of presenting you with uh, some information in the flyer on the tables so uh, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to take a look at that information at your leisure but we're going to try to move right along uh, I'd like to begin my presentations by sharing my personal creed and it is I am only one but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. So that's my little personal creed that I like to share, and it uh, you know creates a little bit of uh, opportunity for uh, inspiration and a little boost uh, as I thought about the devotion uh, this evening, I thought about uh, this past year and uh, reflecting upon the uh, passing of the 400th anniversary of the introduction of African enslaved labor uh, into America near Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. And as I thought more about uh, this, I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to acknowledge uh, the fact that slavery uh, is America's original sin and recognize the contributions to the health and wellness in America made through the oppression and exploitation of black lives. And that our elected officials and Christian medical and health personnel will take an activist role in doing the right thing, in helping to heal the nation in its responsibility and role as a community benefit. Now, 
Uh, there is a link there to the community benefit. That is a YouTube video, and uh, I would encourage you to uh, seek out the community benefit by Larry Hamilton on YouTube. Hopefully, and some of you, uh, when you came in this evening, mentioned the fact that I saw a picture of you. We have a city official uh, back here who said uh, that she could actually provide me with a copy of uh, uh, this uh, uh, photo. Uh, I was uh, blessed and uh, humbly stunned uh, to be called forward to stand uh, to the side of uh, Chris Lee. Chris Lee is a former student of mine. Uh, he's also a fraternity brother of mine, along with, of course, uh, as we approach uh, the uh, observance of Martin Luther King Day next week, Martin Luther King is also a fraternity brother, and uh, perhaps is the reason why I became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity in the first place. Uh, I was pledging that organization because of Dr. King when he was assassinated in April of 1968. I was attending uh, Central State University at the time. But I'm particularly proud of Chris Lee and the Piqua uh, Commission uh, that uh, uh, selected him as the uh, uh, mayor of Piqua in 2020. And uh, we don't have a uh, monochromatic uh, uh, ailment, so we can acknowledge the fact that he's the first black uh, mayor of the city of Piqua, and uh, we wish him well uh, in his leadership role uh, for this municipality. I'm going to talk a little bit about freedom struggle, and uh, I want to call your attention to uh, some things that are extremely important to me, an underground railroad concept and particularly uh, the development of a recognition of children of the light is where I want to focus. Children of the light. Uh, our nation is significantly divided. Uh, there are some ranks of dissension among uh, the Christian community as well. And I'm hopeful that we can uh, be more uh, willing to uh, reconcile and uh, offer solutions to heal uh, the rift that has been developing both politically and spiritually within our country. Uh, we need uh, to pray uh, that uh, that kind of uh, division and divisiveness and strife uh, within our nation uh, uh, at least subsides if not ends. But I want to call your attention to make a contrast of what that kind of division has been like over the history of our nation. Uh, while we are undergoing this kind of strife and division right now, it's nothing new. It's always been there. And so too has been the uh, divisiveness in the ranks of Christianity in terms of whether or not uh, we are uh, exhibiting our conduct and behavior in a compassionate, caring way that makes us children of the light. Okay. What you're seeing here is a resolution that was enacted by Christian brothers and sisters in Mercer County uh, in August of 1846 after they had pushed the Randolph Freedman out of that area. Randolphs, of course, had uh, come uh, to acquire their property uh, in Mercer County. Some reports up to 3,200 acres of land. Uh, when they arrived at New Bremen, uh, they were sat upon by a mob and forced 
back down the Miami Erie Canal uh, to Pickwood, uh, where they encamped at the Johnston Farm for about five days while the city of Pickwood uh, decided whether or not they were going to allow them to remain uh, in the area. I want to call your attention to a couple of things in order to make this contrast or distinction. Our brothers and sisters in New Bremen were of the opinion that the supreme ruler, whom we refer to as God, was of the opinion that some people or groups were undeniably given a distinction or a status of less than that we will use all and every means in our power to preserve and violate those laws and distinctions ordained by the Creator, they're saying, and hand them down unimpaired to our posterity. So they not only said that they were going to <coughs> maintain a level of supremacy that God <laughs> ordained, but they were going to continuously teach their children that same behavior. Now, again, these are brothers uh, and sisters in Christ, and I want to develop a little contrast. Uh, the last, if we come all the way down, they were of the opinion that black laws ought to be in place uh, to maintain a, sufficient, a, a, a position of superiority. Here's a look at the, the black laws at the time Ohio uh, was admitted into the Union. Quickly, blacks had to produce freedom papers. Negroes already living in the state had to register. Newly freed Negroes were forbidden to enter the state unless they had a $500 bond. Negroes were not to be counted when determining the number of elected seats to be filled in the General Assembly. It's almost like the three-fifths clause of the uh, Constitution. Negroes could not benefit from the law providing for the maintenance of the poor in the state. So questions about welfare? No. And Negroes were denied admission to the state common school system. That, that last one is very important. Uh, they could pay taxes, but they couldn't receive an education at the school. <coughs> now, we saw the people in Mercer County who would have called themselves Christians, and I want you to look at a contrasting group of Christians who are called Quakers. Okay? And again, we have these contrasts, I believe, today in our society. And you have to decide who are the children of the light. Okay. So this is uh, taken from a great and good people, Midwestern Quakers and the struggle against slavery. And I think that uh, most people would be in agreement that uh, the Quakers were an unusual lot. Uh, they uh, were unquestionably uh, the least discriminatory uh, on the part of, I believe, Christian denominations in America. And that might be arguable, and I'd be willing to entertain a discussion on that. Uh, but. Uh, from my standpoint, it uh, seemingly uh, is true. This is a minute book. You might be able to see the date. Can you make that out? It's 1827. Okay. The Randolphs arrived in 1846. So 20 years before the arrival of the Randolphs, the Quakers were having discussions relating to the slave trade 
and the oppression of the people of color. They were having committee meetings to decide how to best respond to the care and need of their brothers of African descent. This name here is very important in this uh, minute book. Samuel J. was a Quaker who was responsible for purchasing that property in Mercer County. But I want to show you this is this minute book is from 1841, again, five years before the Randolphs. And we see that in the city of Troy, this is Troy right here, there's a report of the Quakers establishing a school and the colored persons are amount to 77. Okay. Now, they are taxing themselves in order to accommodate the training and education of these persons of color. John Randolph, we know that story. I'm not going to, you know, uh, well there, but we know that they uh, came through Piqua. Uh, the response was not uh, one of uh, a great deal of hospitality. Uh, when they arrived at Lock 9, they were asked to move on. They wanted to stop and quench their thirst at the town well. The sheriff said no. So they moved forward along the Miami Erie Canal. Someone apparently went ahead of them stopped at the Johnston farm and again the role of a Quaker person or at least having a Quaker background was Rachel who was the wife of Colonel John Johnston okay. and we all know because most of us have been to the Johnston farm that there's a spring house and so the report was that uh, the Quaker, Rachel, probably was responsible for allowing the canal boats to uh, disembark their uh, uh, the Randolph Friedman and allowing them to quench their thirst uh, at the spring house at the Johnson Farm. Another Quaker was Augustus Waddles. Waddles um, had come from Connecticut. He had purchased land uh, at in Mercer County, and uh, prior to that, he had been at the uh, Beecher's School in Cincinnati Lane Seminary, where there was an unusual degree of resentment and hostility. See here that Lyman Beecher's son Charles says that they were daily hissed and cursed, loaded with brutal, vulgar epithets, oaths, and threats. Filth and awful were often thrown at them. So these are people who were willing to sacrifice and receive a great deal of persecution on behalf of the safety, well being. Uh, and a level of dignity that is afforded to uh, their African brothers. In this minute book, you can see here, specifically, the Randolphs are mentioned. Randolph colored people in here, they say, we the committee appointed to have some care of the Randolph colored people in our limited, in our limits report the school. So they, again, were establishing a school uh, for these children. Not only were they establishing schools, they were raising uh, money so that the children could have clothing, adequate clothing to attend the school. So I, I, I just want us to, you know, be able to understand the contrast uh, between Christian Brothers in Mercer County and the resolutions 
supporting the black laws and the contrast or care and compassion on the part of uh, Quaker brothers uh, who are sensitive, compassionate, and obviously fulfilling that role of children of the light. I want to make sure you understand something about this process here. My wife and I, three years ago, offered the Johnston Farm $10,846 to create an exhibit reflective of the Randolph narrative at the Johnston Farm because of the Miami Erie Canal Museum that was being built there. Okay. We thought that that was the appropriate uh, location uh, for that kind of exhibit. The friends of the Johnston Farm decided not to accept that. And we want you to understand that they put out documents for teachers because a lot of people say, well, what are you talking about all that stuff in the past for? You know, that stuff was prior to, you know, the Civil War. That was, you know, 160, 170 years ago. What are you talking about all that and bringing all that kind of stuff up? Well, these are things that you should be aware of that just changed last year. These are contemporary issues of equality, caring, sensitivity, compassion, that reflect upon whose we are. Okay? So I want you to understand this. That's why I want to take a little bit of time. And I'm only going to take five more minutes, Brother, <laughs> brother Paul. Uh, <coughs> the people at the Johnson Farm and our community has basically uh, tried to uh, accommodate the Native Americans and European settlers in the historical heritage of the Upper Miami Valley. Please note who's excluded. Again, the mission, their mission statement says, you know, using the story of the Pickwillany village as a starting point, tell about the early interaction between Native Americans and who? Europeans. Who is excluded? Native American relationships with European settlers. The visitor will learn of the relationship between the Native Americans and the European settlers in the 18th and 19th centuries in the Miami Valley. Who's not even considered or valued in their settlement of the Upper Miami Valley? And Here's the Upper Miami Valley would have been a good place to live when Ohio was being settled by both Native Americans and later our ancestors. Whose ancestors? Who are they talking about? Are they talking about an inclusive historical heritage? No. They're talking about Europeans in their relationship with Native Americans. And that's a good thing. All I'm saying is that, you know, there could have been at least uh, an exhibit <laughs> inclusive of the struggle for freedom on the part of the Randolph Freedmen coming to the Upper Miami Valley. So, one of the things that we learned was that there's a, it's a primary and secondary source can be used in historical narratives. One of the reasons why the people at the Johnson Farm declined to accept our $10,846 gift was because they wanted to find whether or not 
there was a mention of the Randolphs in the personal papers of Colonel John Johnston. Now, that is a primary source, but the state of Ohio, the educational system, says you can also use what? Secondary sources. And the secondary sources, the newspapers readily recognize and acknowledge that the Randolphs were at the Johnston Farm going up the canal, coming back down the canal. Okay? So there is a distinct relationship that isn't being acknowledged. Here again we see when they're talking about heritage, whose heritage are we talking about? And here it says seven sectional issues divided the United States after the War of 1812. Ohio played a key role in these issues, particularly with the anti-slavery movement and the Underground Railroad. <coughs> Almost every Ohioan was to be identified with the Underground Railroad, that we were the ones that were helping uh, the slaves escape to freedom. That's a nice story. But the reality is that's not always been the case. So what about the vote to make Ohio State, Ohio a slave state? Did you know that the Ohio legislature took a vote to determine whether or not it wanted to become a slave state? They missed by one vote. One vote. They were willing to consider adding Ohio to the column of the uh, slave states. One vote made a difference. So these are things that we simply needed to point to in connection with the epiphany and my total commitment. People, you know, think that I'm a little zealous. <coughs> no, not really. <laughs> and passionate, I am. And, and uh, this is what I believe Jesus has called me to do and be. Jesus called for total commitment. This was the epiphany, the right concept. And I believe that Piqua can be great. And if we do the right thing, I think we can provide a leadership role or model by which the rest of the nation can reconcile and heal. So we fleshed out the right concept. I think you, you know, have an opportunity to take a look at that. I'm not going to spend any more time with that. There's a twofold purpose for the Randolph and McCulloch Freedom Struggle Complex, which you know that I, since I wasn't able to persuade the Johnson Farm to accept the $10,846 for an exhibit, I thought it was my responsibility to step up and try to make some sacrifices in terms of building that inclusive historical heritage and hopefully the people of Piqua, as children of the light, would join in that effort. So my twofold purpose is to glorify God, the light in a world of darkness, and memorialize the wisdom of the ancestors. Okay? Pay tribute and honor. And the final word is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you. I know that was long for devotion, but it was necessary. And if I don't <coughs> seize the moment to share with you on these occasions like this, I'll never have the opportunity. Because I know I'm not going to be invited to your churches, to your organizations, to have the opportunity to share and enter into dialogue with you. So as a consequence, I've got to take advantage of these kinds of situations when they present themselves.
thank you for your understanding. I hope you learned something. And if you want to, you know, have some uh, discussion after the meeting, uh, I'm willing to stay from now until. Thank you. Can we have a word of prayer first before we uh, move in on? Okay. <clears throat> Dearly fathers, we come to you this evening. We're thankful for this opportunity to gather in fellowship. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for this uh, opportunity to gain insight and understanding. We recognize, Heavenly Father, that you are our creator. We know, Heavenly Father, that we are called upon to make a commitment in discipleship, in following your lead. Heavenly Father, help us to exhibit ourselves in our conduct and our behavior as children of the light. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be caring, to be compassionate, to offer reconciliation and healing. Help us to be repentive, to change our hearts and minds and allow us to be open and receptive to hearing and seeing differing perspectives. God, we ask your blessings upon Piqua in 2020. Allow us to have the hindsight, the vision that 2020 provides. Help us in the way of the new leadership with the election of a Randolph descendant mayor and Chris Lee. We ask and pray, Heavenly Father, for the expansion of awareness of this Randolph narrative in the upper Miami Valley in West Central Ohio. We ask and play, uh, pray for the uh, leadership of, at the state level. And Lord have mercy, we know we need that kind of direction and leadership at the federal and national level. Help us, Heavenly Father, to offer healing and reconciliation and be repentant in whose we are matters who we are. Amen. Thank you, Brother Larry, for that uh, deep insight of what we need to pray about. The one thing that came in my mind when uh, Larry was given this information as I look back to the Word of God where it warns us what we're getting ready to face. It warns us of love being cold. It warns us of division and, and things like that. And I'm happy to say I'm sitting here among people from different denominations. I mean, who would have thought that you would have a Pentecostal president and a PAC related denominational, but God knows what he's doing. And I want to thank everybody here who stepped up and said, well, I want to make a difference, and it doesn't matter what denomination is. And I think that we should always go home and on our knees, pray to God for the sins that our world is doing. Slavery was wrong, and it was, it was a sin, and we need to pray for abortion is wrong, and it needs to be prayed for. The division of understanding of what who we are need to be praised so that we can start seeing like how God sees us. So I want to thank everyone here for stepping up and being there. And I want to appreciate yes. Brother Larry for opening our eyes on maybe deeper things that we just sometimes overlook because we just see the day go by. So thank you, Brother Larry, for what you've given us. <laughs>